So my name is Clark Lee, and um, as I mentioned earlier, I work as a release manager for uh, Microsoft and the Global Publishing Group, and I actually work with publishers that make the games uh, that get on Xbox and Windows. And I'm honored today to have Rebecca Henneman here, uh, who will share yeah, okay. your story and how you got into the industry and how long you've been in the industry. Well, let's put it this, let's put it this way. I've been in the industry probably longer than many of you in this room have, are old. Um, I've been uh, doing video games since 1979. Um, okay. Originally I started doing games on the Atari 2600, but what really got me started in the industry was I was the first pro gamer. Um, in 1980, in June, I answered an ad for video game players to play in the Atari National Space Invaders Tournament for the Atari 2600. <laughs> and I didn't think I could win, but I ended up going to the regionals in LA, won, went to the nationals in New York City in November of 1980, won again, and I got my 15 minutes of fame. Um, with that, I started writing articles for Electronic Games Magazine, and then afterwards, when it was discovered that I had reverse engineered the Atari 2600 to make my own dev kit using parts from Radio Shack, uh, which, by the way, that exact card I've actually found and donating to the uh, National Video Game History Museum. Yeah. And Radio Shack no longer exists. Radio nope, Shack Radio Shack so, wow. doesn't exist now. Um, but the, that card, took it to the Avalon Hill Game Company where I started writing Atari 2600 games and taught all their other programmers. I was so young, I had to lie about my age to get a job there because they thought, oh, you know, you're 18. You can yeah. legally sign this non-disclosure. You can legally sign this employment agreement. Sure, <laughs> yeah, I'll take my school ID and hide it behind my back. <laughs> but. With that, uh, went on to work at a company called Boon Corporation, and then was one of the founders of Interplay Productions, where then I did games like uh, Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, Task Times in Tone Town, Bard's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate, um, Dragon Wars, and we move on all the way up to present day, where that's basically been my career in a really sped up nutshell. Yeah. So you made a, so Rebecca and I know each other from Seattle, and you just made a recent move here. How, how has the change been? So, um, so. Yeah, I just recently relocated from Seattle to uh, the Bay Area. Um, sticker shock is the, <laughs> the first thing I would have to say. Um, but after that, I've been enjoying myself yeah. uh, living here in the Bay Area. So, do you find it more inclusive here in the gaming industry uh, than in Seattle, or? I would say it's less inclusive here in the Bay Area than in Seattle. Oh. Um, the main issue is that um, currently, the job I'm working on is at a tech startup. Now, the tech startup I'm working at is very inclusive, very, very inclusive. I have nothing negative to say whatsoever. Unfortunately, there are other companies out there that are making the news now in the Bay Area that have what we call the programmer culture, and they're the ones who are kind of ruining it for everyone else. Yeah, so just going back, since you've been in the industry so long, how, even though you said the, the, the bro culture, have you... Are you seeing that it's progressed, though? I mean, it's, that it's getting a little bit better than when you first started a long oh, time ago? Oh, it's hundreds of times better than it was when I first started. When we were, when I first was working with Interplay, there was a huge bro culture there. Um, in fact, when we hired um, a, a woman as our office manager, they, it actually made news at the company going like, we actually have a woman running around. And it's like, I was keeping my you know, identity a secret <laughs> at the time. Um, and she was like employee number 20, 21, somewhere around there. And it's like, so everybody else has been male. Um, then in some of the games I was working on, like uh, the original Bard's Tale, um, that was being led by a gentleman by the name of Michael Cranford. And when I complained to him that the game didn't have any female characters, he looked me in the face and said, women don't play these games. So of course, <laughs> when I took over the project for Bard's Tale 3, the very first thing I did was put female characters in there. 
Um, and then, of course, it became the best-selling version of the series, and it's the one most people remember the fondest, uh, Bart's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate. Nice. So I know um, you have some wonderful um, GLAD representatives here, I think, and I wanted to just talk about, like, what's your involvement with GLAD? Well, my... Um, Years ago, was we had this problem called Gamergate. It's still going on, but it's really started to come to a head a few years ago, and I got involved behind the scenes with organizations, the HRC, the Human Rights mm -hmm. Campaign, and GLAD. And for both organizations, I would be speaking to their boards of directors, I would be speaking to their, um, the people who actually run the organizations, championing that they should both start to get into the video game industry, not just for LGBT issues, but also for women's rights and for um, inclusion of anybody who is not a straight white male. Um, over time, I expressed my interest to GLAD that I would like to join their board, and as of June of last year, I did become and accepted a uh, board position on GLAD. Nice, congrats. And with that, uh, GLAD has been instrumental in helping behind the scenes, helping companies to recognize inclusion and to also help just when the issues occur about non-inclusion, that they're getting ready to be able to react in a timely manner. So is, is it offering an educational piece of like a, a training and things like that? Or? Uh, those are things that I can't speak of because I'm not directly involved. That would have to be speaking with uh, Sarah, um, Sarah Kate, okay. who is the president of GLAD, you should speak to her and she will give you all the details of what's going right. on. And the only reason I asked is because when you were talking about um, adding female characters to the game, and then, but do they, do they have stories? I mean, are they just the female characters or did you make sure that there was more to them? And well, the issue with Bart's Tale, at least Bart's Tale 3, yeah. I can, because that's my game and, mm -hmm. I went, and I can speak to that. The whole point of Bart's Tale 3, from my, or Bart's Tale in the series, in my opinion, is that you are writing the story. I'm not. All I do is I create a world for you to live in, but then you are to create your own narrative. And that's why it's very crucial, in my opinion, that when it was character creation time, you could create female, male, a person of color, a different clothing to determine what race you were. And of course, in here we have fantasy races included in, um, as well as other human races. But once you select it, then it's you play the game as you want to play it. And the game figures out your play style and then creates the scenarios to help you enjoy the game as best as you'd like. When I went to do Dragon Wars, I took it even a step further where actions you've done earlier in the game will affect storylines and complete storylines either disappear or appear because of how you interact with the world. And that's why the characters that you create, I have no stories behind them because okay. you're to write them. But the characters in the game that you meet up with, they're deep, rich stories behind them and they're very diverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sorry I haven't played it. That's why I thought I'd ask. Uh, well, the, the <coughs> game was written, the released in 1987, 88? Um, I was graduating so, high school at that time, so yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> so that's fine. Yeah. No, no, that's great. But uh, I'll be releasing Barstow Remasters, so you can play them again, and then okay. you can tell me how much uh, they changed, because I do have the original Barstow 1 and 2 in there as well, nice. so yeah. you can see how they differ versus the way I did things with Barstow 3. Excellent. So is there, um, you know, in, in any tips or tricks that you can, like, share with other individuals that want to get into programming or doing what you do, or...? Well, this, to getting into programming and getting into the game development, the biggest problem is rejection. Don't take it personally. Do not take it personally. So many people would come up with a game idea, put together a prototype, get this game up and running, and then they would show it to a publisher, and the publisher slams the door in their face. Um, your job? Go to the next publisher. They will slam the door in your face. You keep going to different publishers, or if you're able to do it yourself, release it on Steam as your own indie title. Of course, if you take that route, be prepared that as soon as it gets the, the six, oh, sorry, the three months before you release it on Steam, you're not working on your game. You're gonna be busy going to trade shows, um, doing YouTube things, getting people to know that your game even exists. 
Otherwise, you release it and wonder, why is nobody buying my game? Oh, it's because no one's ever heard of it. <laughs> Um, that, yeah, that's so a, different, a, that's a totally different problem right now in the yeah. industry we're dealing with. Wow. So do you have to, I, I'm going to ask this because we sure. talk about yeah, <clears throat> being in the industry a lot. Do you have to deal with ageism quite a bit? Because I, I will say I'm, uh, I don't look my age, but I, I definitely see that I'm usually the oldest person in my group or um, on my team. And so I wondered how, yeah, how that's impacting. Unfortunately, I have to concur that yes, I am actually suffering from ageism now. Um, I have been occasionally trying to get work with companies doing contracts and stuff like that, saying, hey, I could do this work for you and so forth, but there are people who are managers or game studio execs that are in their 30s and 40s, and they don't like the idea of managing somebody who's in their 50s. And as a result, they pass me over um, to someone who's younger, mostly because they know that as someone who's experienced as I am, I only work eight hours a day. Now, granted, when I work eight hours a day, I do the equivalent of 12 to yeah. 16 hours worth of people because you're more efficient. Yeah, when I say, yeah. No, it's more like, oh, that problem. Oh, I've seen that one before. Yep. Here's the fix. Whereas a new person would say, oh, here's a problem. Let's Google this. Let's check <laughs> slash, uh, uh, was it, uh, stack, uh, yeah. stack exchange. Let's check this. Let me do a bunch of experiments. Three days go by. Ah, I think I have a solution. <laughs> Whereas, yeah. whereas for me, it's like, oh, been there, done that, fix it. Yeah. <laughs> they're done. So they're not seeing the value add that you have with all of the historical knowledge so that you have. It, now, granted, it hasn't been that much of a problem, but I have had opportunities slip through my fingers, and the only thing I could think of, besides maybe anti-LGBT issues, mm -hmm. is ageism. And, you know, so wow. I have a trifecta right now. I have, yeah. I'm female. I'm old in their own eyes, <laughs> and I'm also LGBT, yeah. which therefore means that I'm going to have a real hard time getting a job with someone who is not inclusive, because I already strike three of their don't hire, don't hire, don't hire checkboxes. Yeah. And I think of them as three positives, like they're what make me who I am, they, I add value because I'm diverse, and yeah, so it's, it's sad that it's the opposite when it comes to actual employment. That statement is why you're successful. Companies who don't embrace diversity will eventually have a very hard time in the market because when their products are released, the people who are not straight, white, male, they're gonna love the product, but everybody else are gonna say, this doesn't really speak to me, or it doesn't solve my problems, or that's the most misogynistic joke I've seen in this game. I'm stopping it right now. Um, and I've seen one game which um, the, the subtitle of it was called uh, the, the Quest for Coin and Cleavage. <laughs> Who thought of that tagline? <laughs> That's not a tagline that would appeal to women. <laughs> Unless you're lesbian, then, then maybe. <laughs> yeah, that was in another life. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I, I know that we have quite a bit of time, and um, but I do want to. I, I know the other fireside chats have been more uh, us speaking and you sharing. But if anybody would like to ask a question, I am definitely open to hearing anybody else ask a question. And feel free to just let me know. And if not, I'll I'll keep asking you some more okay. questions. Okay. Uh, well, if there are any questions to the audience, I'm more than happy to answer or completely yeah. evade them. Like uh, you know, like I don't know, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, no, no, no. no, no but back to is the thing I have learned through the 30 plus years I've been doing in game development has always been always focus on diversity when developing your products. Make sure you include as many different groups as you can. And especially if you know members of those groups, add them in saying, what do you think of this? Don't say, hmm, I have a friend of mine who is fill in the blank. I think yeah. they will like this because I know this person. No, give it to fill in the blank. Yeah. And they will look at it and say like, no, no, that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, but you're also saying hire them. Don't just use them for, well, you know. Hire their... them, um, bring them on board. Yeah. And if you have something missing, you should reach out and meet. Like a, a good example is, um, I have a friend of mine who I hire from time to time who speaks Arabic. 
And the reason I have him come in is because I don't want my text on the game backwards. Because I, nothing pisses off a Hebrew or Arabic <laughs> speaker than watching the words of the whatever it is written backwards. Because we read from left to right, they go from right to left. And little stupid mistakes like that yeah. really will take off some of your buying public and that's something that could have been so easily avoided if you just had an Arabic speaker look at your translations in the game to make sure that the text really means what it says. Yeah, very important. Um, so uh, I will ask this, um, do you have a favorite game and is, what are you playing right now? Um, right now I'm actually playing, uh, get this, an in, uh, uh, idle game called Zombidle. It's a stupid little game that I can play while I'm on BART, which all it does is that you are the bad guy in an adventure in which you're supposed to bring all these monsters and zombies and stuff and eat the towns. And the currency is skulls, but it's just a standard um, idle game where you just you know, buy some things, let it run on its own, and come back later. But because I haven't had really any time to do any first person games or just play any other games that I kind of play because I've been so busy in the past couple of months. Yeah, the move and everything and then... Yeah, so it's a game I yeah. could play on BART. <laughs> and is there one that you'd also recommend? I mean, anything? Uh, well, let's see. Other ones I like to play only because I was working on it was uh, Age of Empires Definitive Edition. Um, it's a remastering of the original 1996 Age of Empires by Microsoft and no, they're not paying me in any way, shape, <laughs> or form to put this. I. Yeah like it. And um, another game I really liked recently was um, the latest Geometry Wars. I, I just like, I like Robotron. And Geometry Wars is just basically just shoot everything in sight and it's a nice Twitch game. Um, nice. Those are the games I tend to be playing and okay. I, I kind of enjoy them a lot. Nice. So is there, um, I'm trying to think of what's, uh, is there do you, um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question in a way that's... <laughs> out with it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so when you go to events, uh, and I, do you feel like you're included? Um, and I'm, I'm talking about whether LGBTQIA events, and do you feel that like you're included? And do, do you think that there's things that we could do better? And I only ask that because, again, you've been around for a long time, and you've seen the progression. Um, towards more diversity and inclusion, but do you really honestly feel like there's, that you're actually welcomed? Um, yes, I, I, I resoundingly answer that question with yes. PAX has been exceptional in listening to some of our advice about doing things like the diversity lounge. Yeah. The, um, we even, I was doing a bunch of talks there with a group called Press XY, um, and PAX, you know, does gender uh, neutral restrooms to get around the bathroom problem. Um, but they go out of their way to make certain that you're included. Up to and including things like if someone is harassing women, they will escort that person out so that the women know that they're listened to and that that type of behavior is not to be tolerated. And also As GDC no, is the same thing, is that they are going out of their way to, now they don't have a diversity lounge as far as I'm aware, but I know that they are doing diversity talks and trying to let the industry know that diversity is the wave of the future. And that it, it really helps in the sense that diversity is good for the bottom line. Diversity makes money. See, that's the thing that really needs to be told to the bigwigs upstairs yeah. at all these corporations is that by blinding yourself to a small demographic, even though you think it's the majority demographic, it might be in one country, but we have over 140 countries in this world and they all have money. And I would like a little bit of that money in my purse. <laughs> and the only way it's going to happen is if the products that we all, as an industry, create Consume, are diverse, yeah. they are uh, tolerant, mm -hmm. and they also don't offend. Yeah. And with that, they will then want to open up pocketbooks to go ahead and blow up zombies, because who doesn't want to kill zombies? Yeah. <laughs> that is true. <clears throat> so do you, do you feel like you're also getting compensated for what you bring? 
Because as much as it's diverse and inclusive, or there are companies that are trying to do that, do you also feel like, having been a founder of a company, I mean, mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that you're actually getting paid for what you're worth? I only recently have been getting paid what I'm worth. <laughs> um, before, oh. but before I had to work in the game industry, and trust, you know, when you own your video game, own video game studio, the yeah. problem what most people don't understand is that when you own your video game studio, the last person who gets paid is the CEO. My title is the CEO. So there were times which uh, I didn't get a paycheck. <laughs> Everybody else did because, you know, yeah. they, get a, they get their wages first. But if any time that money goes down, I just think, well, I'm not getting paid. Um, but now I'm actually working for a firm. Um, I'm getting paid. I'm getting paid what I'm worth. Um, but things that resonate with me mm -hmm. about the value is that while Bard's Tale 1 and 2 did sell very well, Bard's Tale 3 is the one that ended up in the Smithsonian because it was diverse, it was inclusive, it was compelling, all because one of my focuses on creating that title from the moment I started that project was to include as many people as I can and in the end result, seeing it right there at the, the art of the video game, seeing Bard's Tale 3 right there, um, and it was, and that was done by a poll of something like over 100,000 people. So it wasn't just a few people curating. It was the general public made right. that call. Nice. It, it, that, to me, just reinforces that inclusivity works. Inclusivity makes money. <laughs> <laughs> well, and hopefully it again lines your purse with some more money as yeah, well. Yeah, money is good because, you know, I do have rent to pay. And yeah. <laughs> I'm living in Sticker Shockville, so... Oh, yeah. Uh, there's an adage in business. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. In this town, it's kind of hard to keep it. <laughs> I believe it. So I'm going to actually go back to GLAD because I did not know that GLAD was involved in video gaming. So my understanding of GLAD was always it was just film entertainment and stuff. And so I guess how is... And how you wonder are... why I joined the board. <laughs> so, <laughs> so do you know what the educational piece will be? And, and uh, again, educating all of us who are into video games but don't see the, well, the connection? Plans are being done right now. Okay. There are things that I don't know what I am at liberty to say, so therefore I'll just err on the right. side of caution. But be on the lookout for initiatives and things from GLAD that are specifically focused in the video game industry. Nice. Yeah. Oh. Excellent. This is great. Did anybody, again, I'll open it up if anyone else has a, anything they want to ask. Rebecca? I will give that opportunity. Yeah, well, I, got, I, I know I'm trying to be inclusive up. with the audience. Like, <coughs> um, great. So we still have a little bit more time, so I'll, I'll, okay. I'll again ask. Um, yes. Oh, Rebecca. So Rebecca and I, I will say this, we've, we've known each other for a while, and we only see each other intermittently, and it's always nice when I see yeah, well, you. Yeah, we met each other at Glee. Yeah. The gay lesbian employees at, at Microsoft. Microsoft. So we have that connection, and when we were doing this event, I was like, oh my gosh, you would be great to come and speak and then just share what you know because, again, being older, um, well, what's I fun? just think it's a value to just to share that, uh, the resources yeah. that you have and then, again, to let people know that um, there is opportunity and mm -hmm. that you can bring your authentic self wherever you go and that you should. And, um, and then also that's, uh, I know it was said earlier by Gordon, like, it gets better, but it really yeah. does. It really does well, get better. Well, it does get better. I mean, I transition now... You, some of you may not know, I'm a transgender woman. The others probably do because you have Google and you can Google my name. Um, when I was transitioning back in 2003, 2004, that was a time in which people who transitioned were basically thrown out of the industry. Examples like Danny Bunton, um, Jamie Fenton, so forth, where when they came out, they were thrown out of the game industry. Now, granted, you know, there's Jamie Fenton, she's now come, you know, got a, a new career, so far she's doing great. But I knew that the moment I came out, I had to be prepared that the words, I am so fired, is in my vernacular, and I had to have an escape pan saying, well, let's see, I can maybe fly a plane, learn to fly a plane and be a pilot, or maybe I could be a writer. I mean, it's just like, I ain't working in this town anymore. Fashion model. Fashion model, who knows? <laughs> Uh, but, and I'm going to speak here, Electronic Arts was the company I worked for. I just started Electronic Arts at the time. 
I'd already been preparing my transition, and as soon as I started the job at Electronic Arts, one of the things that got me to join up with Electronic Arts was that I read their employee handbook, and they just put in it, if you are transitioning, this is what you need to do. And I'm like, it's in the handbook? So within a few months after joining up Electronic Arts, I went to my manager and says, um, see this new policy? Um, it applies to me. <laughs> and it was such a non-event at Electronic Arts That's good. that not only did I double my work output mm -hmm. because I was like so happy to be my fun self and knowing that I wasn't going to be fired yeah. for being who I am, but they even had part of the policy that if people were discriminating against me, they would be the one who would be getting fired. Nice. Discrimination was not to be tolerated. And after that, I became a role model in the sense that I then put, changed my Facebook profile, my, uh, I had a blog and everything like that, announcing, and then of course people out of the woodwork at EA and other companies saying, well, I'm trans too, but no one knows. And I've lost count with the number of people who are not just trans, but LGBT, LGB in, in, in any capacity, who've come out to me and saying, like, even at Sony, I had a friend of mine who, a coworker, who came out to me as just gay, and he wanted me to advice on, okay, I'm gay, how do I break it to my wife? Yeah. And I go like, okay, well, slightly different, but yes, I came out to my wife as trans. Similarities. <laughs> Um, but of course, my friend now is living a very happy, authentic yeah. wife. I'm sorry, authentic life with his husband, because after time they divorced, and then he married the, his boyfriend, and they're doing great. But back to what I was saying is that I keep uh, my website up. I have my Facebook page. I have my gamer tag, and anybody who ever is out there who is still closeted and just wants someone to talk to, I'm available. My nickname yeah. is Burger Becky, and that's pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Twitter, my gamer tag, yep. Steam, etc. So if you ever want to just reach out to me just to hear somebody, uh, either for advice or just, just someone to say, please, I'm suffering, at least someone to hear me, um, you know, I'm there. And of course, if you're suicidal, I will give you the suicide prevention hotline because, you know, it does get better. Because there was a time in my life I too was suicidal because I knew that once I came out in electronic arts, had I gotten fired or had I been pushed out shortly after, um, my career was over, totally over. Um, didn't happen. And Yay. since then, my career has blossomed. I mean, my name is on hundreds of games, um, many of them post-transition. And of course, I adopted my old uh, nickname, going from uh, you know Burgers at Sis and to now I'm Burger Becky. Yeah. Um, so when people are saying, "Hey, it's Burger," I'm still going by Burger, <laughs> except it's Burger Becky. <laughs> but again, yeah. I do emphasize that if you just want to talk to someone who's been through some of these transition issues or something, or just you know, want to know what it's like being LGBT in the game industry and you don't want to say it in the public forum because no one knows. Yeah. And trust me, there are people in this audience, I'm certain there's a couple in here going like, no one knows. Um, I will be discreet. I will not say your name ever uh, unless you let me. But uh, it's back to handle is Burger Becky, like hamburger Becky. <laughs> and it's pretty much on everything. Twitter, um, um, gamer tags, Yay. both PlayStation and um, um, Xbox, yeah. and so forth. But uh, and of course Steam. But and I'm on there all the time, either playing something stupid like the Zombital <laughs> or making another update to Battle Chess. <laughs> nice. Well, um, if no one else has any questions or has any questions, um, I know we're at time. Okay. Um, so because I think there's a half an hour remaining for this event, and we definitely want people to enjoy some more drinks and food and stuff, uh -huh. but uh, again, Rebecca, thank you so much for yeah. participating in this and, and letting people know more about you, yeah. and uh, okay. if anyone has any questions that they well, don't want to do Well, I do want to stage. close with one thing. Yeah. GLAD is a wonderful organization, and I really, really want to ask any and all of you, please generate, uh, please donate. Yeah. Um, we do need the money to help us 
do what we're trying to do in growing awareness of diversity in the video game industry. And we both need your help financially as well as questions and stuff. Just, you know, reach out. And we have programs that are currently being in development that um, you may be benefiting from and you know, we want to hear from you. Yeah. Or your organization, or your company, or, or yeah. your employer. Yeah, if you ever want, if you need a de software developer, old school, O-L-D-E-S-K-U-U-L, we got people <laughs> standing by who are sitting there going like, I'm unemployed until I actually have a paying project. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rebecca, again, and thank, every, thank you to everyone in the audience for um, participating as well.